Railways are very good at moving bulk materials very fast, but their size and lack of friction between the locomotive and the rails makes them very impractical when negotiating tight bends and on uneven surfaces. Roads are good for moving stuff over uneven terrain and getting to places otherwise inaccessible by rail, but can only move a small amount of goods at one time. If only there was a way to combine the two, to be able to follow a twisting and uneven road while also having the speed and lack of friction as a railway. Born in 1826, Jean Lamangin was a French engineer who felt he knew exactly how to get the best of both worlds when it came to road and rail. He designed a sort of hybrid monorail system, where the line would consist of a single rail laid on the ground. Rolling stock for the line would have two types of wheels, double flanged wheels mounted in the middle of the vehicles that would ride on the rails and two larger wheels set on either side of the locomotive and carriages. The larger wheels rested on the ground either side of the rail and were used for stability, and on the locomotive doubled as the driving wheels. The middle wheels meanwhile carried most of the weight to fully utilize the lack of friction between the wheels and the rails. It was essentially the middle point between road and rail. Should the locomotive require additional traction, the front wheel could be adjusted to put more or less weight on the driving wheels by means of a screw mounted at the front of the engine. A person had to be positioned at the front of the engine at all times to adjust it when necessary, making it look as if they were steering the engine, which of course they weren't. La Manja presented his idea at the Paris Exhibition in 1867, building a short section of line and a locomotive referred to as the locomobile, garnering a positive reception. Once the exhibition was over, La Manja, confident in his design, opened a 5km line between Rancy and Montfermeil to further demonstrate its potential in 1868, following the public road that linked the two suburbs. Not only was the line laid cheaply, but his locomotive was able to tackle a 7% grade on the route with relative ease using nothing more than the traction it had on the road. It was also capable of travelling at speeds of 16 km an hour, and negotiating tight bends much better than a locomotive of the same size. The Duke of Saldana visited the line in 1869 at the request of Portugal's Prime Minister to gauge whether the system was worth adopting for use in urban areas. He was quite impressed by the design and wrote to the Prime Minister in favour of the railway. Saldana felt La Manja's system was perfect for urban transport of goods and passengers, as the rails could be cheaply laid on existing public roads while taking up minimal space. Envisioning lines connecting Lisbon to Sintra, Milhada to Viseu, Oporto to Braga, Beja, Guardiana, and so much more. Upon hearing word the Prussian government wanted possession of both La Manja and his railway design, Saldana persuaded La Manja to work for him instead. Dead. Despite his eagerness, Saldana wasn't the first person in Portugal wanting to build one of these railways, as Manuel Feijó had proposed a line be built in 1868 using La Manjat's system, but opposition from the government caused the plans to fall through. Once he and La Mancha arrived in Portugal, it was decided that a short test line should be built between Lisbon and Le Maire, with Saldana mostly paying for it out of his own pocket. Totaling 5 kilometers in length, the line was opened in 1870 with much fanfare, being quite the big event for locals. The demonstration, however, wasn't confidence-inspiring. Thanks to rain, the engine only made it 10 meters out of the station before coming to a stop and another 10 meters before stopping again. It also seemed to struggle climbing grades despite its supposed brilliant climbing abilities. A little disconcerted but not deterred, Saldana set out to raise money to expand the railway into the 100km urban network he envisioned. He established the Lisbon Steam Tramway Company Limited in London in 1871, taking on Edwin Clark Punchard and Company to build and run the line, and appointing Francis Trevithick, grandson of Richard Trevithick, as chief engineer. 
Trevithick came up with a new design for the engines that were to run on the line. Built by Sharp Stewart, the end result was essentially a standard saddle tank engine, with a 11211 wheel arrangement, bells, and a hydraulic cylinder at the front to increase or decrease the traction on the engine's driving wheels from the cab. Trevithick also specified that instead of running on the road, wooden planks should be laid on either side of the metal rail for the driving wheels to run on. To test the design, half a kilometre of track was built in Buckhurst Hill, Essex, where an engine could be steamed and demonstrated to the public in 1873 before being sent to Portugal. The line had grades of 1 in 18 and 1 in 22, climbs that would be very difficult for a conventional locomotive to handle. Number 2, Sintra, was chosen for the display, and impressively, not only managed to tackle the grades, but was also capable of reaching speeds of up to 20 miles an hour. Things were looking good until the next day, when it rained. In dry conditions, the line worked a treat, but once the wooden boards got wet, the wheels kept slipping, essentially rendering the engine powerless. Despite the drawback, construction of the lines from Lisbon to Torres Vendras and to Sintra were mostly completed, and so plans to use these engines continued on. By May 1873, both lines were completed and open to the public. The engines were more than capable of tackling the tight bends and grades the line followed, however, what Saldana didn't account for were the drawbacks La Manja's system had. As well as the wheels slipping in wet weather, the engines were prone to derailing due to faults with the front hydraulic or obstructions like stones on the line. On rainy days, passengers would often have to get out and push while workers poured sand on the rails. Some passengers, as a result, started carrying bags of sand with them in preparation for some journeys. In dry weather, dust kicked up by the engine often got into moving parts of the locomotive, causing them to break down. For passengers, not only was the dust an issue, but so was comfort, as the carriages were quite cramped and rode poorly on the rails. Because the lines followed public roads, trains had a tendency to run down animals and pedestrians, which, combined with the derailing issue, led to the trains running at reduced speeds. As a result, trains were often delayed or ran late, with delays of up to 10 hours having been recorded. It was so bad that many people simply didn't use the tramway, despite their lack of transport alternatives. As a result, the line started losing money quickly. By July 1875, after less than two years in operation running at a constant loss, the tramway was finally closed and the company was liquidated. Not only had the Duke lost a considerable amount of money, but so had many company shareholders. Worse still, several people who had promoted the company were taken to court for fraud, having paid off a journalist to report favourably for the investment and dishonestly increasing the price of their shares. I'm no lawyer and it's a bit of a mess to explain, but the legal battle continued until 1894, 19 years after the railway had closed. The Duke of Saldana passed away in 1876, and the line was quickly forgotten by the people of Portugal. The line between Rance and Montfermé, meanwhile, had long since been destroyed during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. La Manja, meanwhile, tried to sell his system elsewhere, hoping to open another line in France and possibly in Switzerland, but the faults presented by the Lisbon tramway were enough to deter people from investing in his design. He also attempted to sell the railway as a means of towing barges, managing to build a short test line, but this was abandoned after years of delays. Railways, meanwhile, were developing rapidly, and the advantages La Manja's design had of more traction on grades and ability to negotiate tight bends were quickly being rendered moot. In the end, while La Manja's railway did work to an extent, rather than giving rail vehicles more traction and road vehicles more speed and pulling power, the final product cancelled the advantages of both and left an engine that was not only weak and slow, but awkward to maintain too. Could a road rail design like this work today? Who knows? But let La Manja's railway act as a reminder to be careful when combining the best of both worlds, as it can often leave you with the worst of either, and that you should always properly test something before you invest in it. Subscribe for more.